website. Um, top of the page up here gives you four location options, each one of these. So we obviously use one when we're flying up north. Um, so if you want to click into that later. Cool. The next thing we get are forecasts. Um, so we've got Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we have high above average and average forecasts. So we usually look at these a, a few days out, but when we want to go flying, for example, what day is it? Tomorrow? <laughs> Thursday, well, we'll look at above average now, and in the morning we'll look at high when it becomes available. So if we look at above average for Thursday, this is the thermal forecast. So this is the thermal updraft velocity buoyancy shear ratio. That's the one where we looked at the stipple and the colours to give us the thermal strength. Um, you can look at either a viewer, which is just one box we hit through each day, or you can look at each hour, but we tend to use this one link page so you can scroll <coughs> down very easily. Well, I always use the viewer. <laughs> huh? I always use the viewer. Oh, so you can just run the mouse up and down the day yeah. rather than having to uh, yeah. I don't because it doesn't work on my phone. Oh, <laughs> right. sorry, I don't know. What do you have to say? It's on the PC. But yeah, we, if you want to click it there later, uh, on the page. So this is tomorrow, and we can see we've got a lot of blue, and I said I wouldn't go fine if it was blue. But this is uh, 9 o'clock in the morning. If we scroll down a bit, we get to 10 o'clock, colours are changing, 11. 12 o'clock, so we're probably usually on launch ready to go at 12 if we're going to go. We look at Moyers Hill, uh, we can see we've got dense stipple everywhere. There's a little bit of no Oh, is that no? No, it's no. Let's go. Take the last one. Yeah. George, I was like, trick more and more. You're testing people. <laughs> so that's 12 o'clock. Looking okay for tomorrow if we go to 1 o'clock. Looking better. Who's going to fly tomorrow? Looking better again. And so there's no stubble. We, we're getting yellow. Five to six hundred feet. <coughs> that looks really good. And if we go a few more hours and stop. Five o'clock, it's starting to deteriorate a little bit again. We're getting some stubble. The lift is going down. So that's how you can see across the day. The thermals will start. Not very well in the morning, we'll get stronger in the middle of the day and then weak again at night. So I use that page a lot. Sometimes I look at thermal link height. Sometimes I look at <coughs> overdue element cloud base. If you're going to look at these cloud ones, I've been told to use the ones where it says see, the potential is more than zero. And I don't know why, but that's what I was told. So instead of using the cumulus potential, use this one. Instead of the open development potential, use that one. Also look at boundary layer, cloud cover. I don't really, I don't really use these much, uh, but I use all of the wind ones. So we have a look at convergence for tomorrow, and we probably want to go through till after twelve o'clock. So it's not going to start. So one o'clock. Again, we've got the yellow sort of line going. Where is Moyers? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So we've got it sort of going past Moyers and up north like it usually does. Yes. And then if you look at the next hour, it's still there. Oh, it's a bit better there. Sometimes over three o'clock. Four o'clock is still looking good as well. <laughs> So five o'clock. Five o'clock. It's still there. So somebody can do a big out and return tomorrow and be good. So somebody should get a car tomorrow. Okay. So if we go back um, and just have a quick look at the boundary layer wind. Wind. Boundary layer average wind. Yeah, you can see our, our wind on 
other side of the convergence. We've got a north easterly up here and a sort of west north west, west, north west up here. Really this is, this is our. Um, oh, true. Sorry. Yeah, this, this boundary layer wind is is uh, at altitude above launch. It's um, this this one will give you your surface wind speed. Yeah. was 
<coughs> the red dot is um, average surface temperature. So you can see it's, it's a little distance away from the bottom of the temperature trace. So the further to the right that dot is, the warmer the surface is going to be. Found out. <laughs> it took me ages to find out what that dot is. Um, but yes, average surface temperature. So if the surface is hotter, the thermals are going to heat up quicker and more regularly. And also, the amount of area in between this dotted line and this temperature line, the more area in there, the better the thermals are going to be. If that dotted line is really close to the red temperature line, you're probably going to have weak thermals. If it's out like that, or even over this way a bit more, thermals will be stronger. <coughs> the other thing I use that for sometimes is to decide how many clouds to wear. Because you can look at cloud base yeah. and decide that's how right. full temperature it's going to yeah, be. Yeah, that's right. If you want a temperature at cloud base, just go to cloud base and run down parallel to these isotherm lines, and you can find a temperature at cloud base about 12 degrees or something.
it probably wasn't before this was enabled, but I was like a motorcycle courier in the UK back in the 90s-ish. I used to, as I was riding around the, the, the UK and even sometimes the whole country, I would take a film camera with me and I would take a picture of either what the weather was like in general, some interesting weather feature, because sometimes I go through fronts in both directions, and I'd cut that, I'd print the picture and I'd cut the weather, the synoptic weather chart out of the newspaper and put them in flip folders so that the photograph and the weather map and the operator, I've still got them I think in a box in the garage somewhere, I've got like two years of every single day doing that. And each by that, and each by that forcing yourself to think about it, even on the days when it's shitty, that you, you absorb more knowledge that way. So like you, you've got to use this. When I first learned this, I learned all of the lines that we just had a look at and all how to measure things, and I forgot it pretty quickly and just ended up looking at all the stuff we just did. <clears throat> Depends how much you want to put into it. But again, it's, it's as simple as you want to. Remember, it's only a forecast. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It is only a forecast. <coughs> Plenty of times we've been asking for looking at the actually why of best and we still need good lines. Yeah, that's actually why I put that photo up on the front slide of the rain coming down with the people mm -hmm. flying. It's, it's, yeah. Still look out the window and still look at the sky. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll just a good little segue about talking about making plans for your flights. Obviously, Alex's flight um, was, not, I mean, not to say it was lucky, it was a very good skill, but it wasn't planned. He didn't plan to go out of that. He just planned to go fly, and he was probably thinking he was going to Moyes, oh, to, to Murray, just like, where am I? What am I doing? My heads, um, just like everybody else. He ended up going out the back. Joe's already um, flipped through. Um, stuff about his one, so we can skip that one. Um, I'll just quickly skip through all this. Um, but you can see his flight path if you match it up to the same area on the, um, the raft, pretty much bang on. And you'll notice with some of these, the, the, the next to the, or the next one as well, um, is on the eastern side of that, which is probably because that's just the, the lifting side of that air pocket as the two come together, one's going to go under the other. The eastern one was probably where the lift was, so the fact he had good lift on that eastern side of where that thermal forecast is, um, may be that there's good lift there, or maybe that that convergence line in reality was just pushed that little bit more uh, over the east coast. But that was Alex's um, out there. Is that where that quarry is? On the other side of the, the dome? The range, where uh, yeah, once you go to the dome, there's a quarry up there. If you're heading over from Manakana and cross over, that was kind of where his convergence line set up. Um, so this one here is the so far distance record for this year from Moyes, um, the grandiose Graham Surrey, who, uh, who had a great flight. Um, and I did so <laughs> show his, uh, his flight. No, we had it was a really good day, um, and uh, his flight line you can see it following a pretty typical um, convergence path for for Moyes for a, a standard sort of convergence day for Moyes. Um, took off, uh, you can see just up the top there at 1355 is when his track log starts around about then. Um, he was in the air for just under three hours, so. Um, just sort of 4.45 for should be when he um, landed. So that's 2 o'clock, around about when he, when he took off, and you can see the third mile draft velocity is quite good. And this is the midday um, skew T, or TEF uh, You can see the wind direction is next to the wind uh, noise. The wind direction is pretty much dead southerly. And you've got a cloud base there of nearly 3,000-ish feet, uh, maybe three and a bit. Um, and I think on was that Graham? Was that the day where a bunch of people had bombed or something? And we turned up late. Um, that was a day that Ian yeah. yeah. bombed, and there was one other person who bombed yeah. in the past. So, so it was very much about taking. Yeah. 
being lucky and taking off at the right cycle to get up and away. Yeah, the Rebel Nash brothers were there as well. They took off um, a few minutes, five, ten minutes before me, um, and I turned up, and they were people were just kind of boating around, but I was like, it's going to kick off, it's going to kick off now. So I quickly got my gear out and got set up, and literally by the time I set my gear up, I pulled the wind a little bit just to get it sort of into a nice wall, and behind me I looked over my shoulder and um, Elliot was rising, and so I pulled the wing up and I was straight into a three and a half meter surf, um, herbal, right on the front of launch, and within I think it was like five minutes, six minutes on the home base, um, and just going north, gone. Um, what the mistake I made is you'll see with convergence developers, I had a <coughs> convergence, ended up turning around coming back to find the two Grahams chasing me, and I was too low at that point to get back up to where they were. But 12 o'clock, and then 2 o'clock. So this is when uh, Graham took off. It was um, quite an afternoon, I think about half an hour or so I was caught. Yeah, it would have been about that. Um, um, and you can see, later. Yeah. You can see that the difference there between the, uh, the dash lines mm -hmm. and how much how much taller that is. So when he took off, he probably would be looking at about a 5,000 foot cloud base over launch. Um, sorry, about a 4,500 foot cloud base over launch and um, some pretty good good lift. And the clouds were really starting to pop, um, getting a nice convergence line. I didn't manage to get a photo, but you could just see blue sky east and west, and this absolute motorway of clouds um, running down the middle of the bottom. And then miraculously they touched, um, but there's no cloud line at four o'clock. However, if you were flying underneath it, it was real bumpy, really rough, mm -hmm. um, and it felt like you were flying in soon to be rain clouds, um, like not comfortable flying. Even even said he took off again and flew it, he even said on radio while he was flying, but it was really outrageous and didn't feel that comfortable with it. Um, but that was when he was still back over Walkworth, and south of the dome was getting really rough, like with the two lines connecting. North of the dome was quite smooth and nice thermals but just that conversion as well. This is it, um, you can see it's sort of developing at one o'clock and then at two o'clock that you can actually see that in the sky like where the green and light blue is was clear skies and where that yellow is was just a cloud highway So um, what happened here, I mean I think I landed at 2.30 or something, uh, 2.33, and literally the two Grahams just at great altitude above me struggling away at small climb thermals and kind of blue sky convergence about halfway between the dome and um, one of my heads, the convergence clouds kind of disappeared and, uh, and they sort of continued fighting away and uh, flew quite a lot further. It was quite difficult then because yeah, there was quite clear clouds when I took off and it was get up and try yeah. to get into the convergence and go straight, but yeah, then they just sort of, yeah, you couldn't really see where the convergence was. And it was quite becoming a stronger sort of southwesterly as we were going up as well. So you go to the western side of it? Yeah, yeah. In that context, does anybody know where the, the word land is buried? as an altier or land of the long white cloud. Because that's what we're talking about, isn't it? The conversion. Yeah. yeah. But I don't understand where's the land. I thought that's the Fenrir. <laughs> well, I don't know, if you're saying altier at all, maybe you say Fenrir as well. Mm. <laughs> but um, you don't uh, you, I, I for some reason always assumed that the long white cloud was a Norway starch. Was what? A Norway starch, like the big wave systems down south and up here as well. Which you can see from 200 k's away, whereas convergence is a very local. I assume this is effect. different. Uh, I, d I don't know. I always assumed that it was. Thanks for clarifying. That, that, that was just my assumption because that's very. You, the, the big wave system is fairly unique to New Zealand. Convergence lines you can get in lots of them. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, and it's just it, when you yeah. see when you see one, you go, my God. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, thanks for clarifying that. Sailors probably see a little more of it. Yeah. Kind of yeah. They, they would have spotted it hundreds of k's out to sea. Uh, As you can see, it was still still going at 4 o'clock, and um, Graham landed at Something like, oh, it would have been maybe close to five, I think. Yeah. I think yeah. yeah. Um, and this is the little square of uh, that convergence line. Um, <coughs> and you can see Graham's flight. And then when you map it across, um, he was sitting along that convergence line for um, the majority of that, especially. I mean, from always over the dome, it was yeah. impossible not to sit on the convergence line. It was so obvious and so powerful that you just kind of rode it. Um, at one point, I was 30 years in, on bar, doing, I think it was like 50 kilometers an hour forward speed, um, and going up and half a meter a second. And I was like, what is going on? Like, yeah. This is going to be the greatest day ever. And then I left <laughs> up and later. <laughs> <laughs> Where I take that big westerly jank at the end there, that was just due to airspace rather than the most efficient way to fly because, uh, yeah, if I had my choice, I would have just been heading straight the hell up, but um, it's just about trying to get around to the westerly side of that massive big MBZ around, uh, around um, Whangarei, which is uh, yeah. the real issue. Why is it so bad? <laughs> well, <laughs> yep. Yeah. I think there, there were some quite significant uh, arguments against it being so big, but we lost out in the end, unfortunately. The, um, the benefit of me landing early was that uh, by the time Graham had packed his bag up, he didn't even walk out of the farm and his taxi turned up. So yeah, yeah, it was great. We didn't make the, the front yeah, gate yeah. of the farm and these guys came around. Nice foot nice ride right home. <laughs> I, I often wonder, though, if you look at the maps and the convergence lines during the day, and we look at the flights that people do early and bomb, and people go much later and how far they get, I often think that we don't use the potential of the day, that our flights are, even just time-wise, too short, mm. and that we spend more time in the air, and it doesn't actually entirely shut out, shut off in between, yeah. that we should actually really be able to fly quite a lot further. Yeah. It's a challenge. <laughs> if, you, if you look, compare the flights and the forecasts and the actual weather, I don't think we make the most of the day. Well, there's, um, there's a little bit of self-indulgence coming up. There was a flight that uh, Lucas and I did um, that was, it was literally like that. And it was a case of mentally making the decision in the sky, don't outfly the convergence because it was the only thing that was going to get anyone there. Um, and like Joe was saying about make a plan for your flight, like don't just go to boys, get your gear out, jump up in the air and be like, oh, I wonder where I'm going today. Um, because if you don't learn from it, I mean, you might learn about individual thermal, but you don't really learn about organising your flying, planning, looking at the weather properly, studying the convergence. Whereas this was a case of looking at RAS for 24 hours out, realising how good the potential was, and the fact that the convergence line was going to set up on the western side of the MBZ, which meant we might be able to go completely past the front of MBZ. Um, and then messaging people to say, hey, I'm taking tomorrow off work, I've already got leave in, and we're going flying at Devil's Hoops King. Um, it ended up being just four of us, which shocked me considering the rust, but um, I mean, to be honest, I was shocked I got the day off work, so. <laughs> <laughs> Unless the rust was not working on that day, like yesterday, it wasn't working at all, it was a convergent forecast. Yeah. And yeah. all there was, there was the odd wisp here and there. By the time you got to a wisp, oh yeah, there's another wisp over there. So you couldn't make any plans. Yeah, and, and, but I mean, the key is, if you go with a plan and it doesn't work, you can adapt. If you turn up with no plan, and you're just constantly playing the adaption game, you're probably going to miss a 50, 60 kilometer day, because you're bumming around taking 5k hurdles. Um, so just in contrast to that, Alex is there. No. And also, because he was not a local pilot, he didn't have a preconceived idea of what the day would be. He just won there a few times. Yeah. So his so plan was to find those pilots he could And it just happened when he turned around and came back. Because he could have been pretty good. Yeah, yeah. just adapted. And Alex is a hell of a pilot too. Like oh, he has a couple of Canadian records. And, uh, I'm suggesting it's not this good. But he, oh no, no, I just mean he, he was able to make that decision in the year. Yeah. It'd be like, and rapidly realise, hang on, I've flown this far with this much ease, I'll hit a headwind, probably a convergence point where I can turn around and fly the whole way back. Um, whereas, like myself, if I hit that headwind, I'll probably just be like, oh, it's on the land. Um, 
<laughs> because I, I'm not thinking as quickly in the head as he is. Um, just another little point I just want to make too is that if there are no cards and it's a blue day, um, don't don't give up because there's, there's still going to be a firm was a forecast, there's still going to be thermals, it's just that there's no cards. Um, I had a, had a glider pilot say to me once, I was complaining about the green blue competition and he said, don't worry about it, when it's blue it's easy, there's only one way to go and that's straight for the turn point. <laughs> <laughs> So with that convergence line there, 
he was outflying the convergence constantly. You know, just we need to be here doing this stuff. <laughs> and, and it meant that I had nobody to comply with when it really yeah. got to I think there was a shame if you would have um, met up and slowed down yeah. a bit. The problem is he had my radio, my my spear radio, but he hadn't turned it on. <laughs> and he had my spear radio because he was in such a hurry in the morning, he'd grab a radio or a radio, just grab the paraglider. And so while I was talking to him on the radio, I'm yelling at him like, "Get back here! Come and fly! What are you doing? Don't fly over there! That's the NBZ!" He was just like gone, <laughs> um, and I had no idea what he was up to. So you didn't do that thing. But you can see here the line that um, ended up taking this pretty, pretty straight, and it was literally just I picked a, a heading and I was just going on that heading, the convergence, um, straight over the water, which was at one point, but um, with enough height was okay, and it pretty much matched up with the um, convergence point, and you can see where I landed. We just needed to be there a few kilometers more oh, yeah. east. And look at that red dot there. And then we would have just been <laughs> screaming. But yeah. And that could have, I mean, Kai Ho, you're looking at 100, 100 probably 125 k's. Um, and that would have been an epic day. That was the one you played again? Yeah. We'll try to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't rely on that. I mean, the other day I went down to Kai Mai's with a plan and walked out twice. So. <laughs> Sometimes it just doesn't work out. Um, but that, that was the first time I ever actually planned a flight, and it worked really well. And I would seriously recommend people doing that um, in the future, even if they just plan to fly to Woolworth or plan to fly to the Manakana or Omaha Beach, so you might even have to cross the dome. But just come up with a plan to follow. You'll learn a lot. Um, yeah, has anyone got any final questions at all on any better stuff? Can we go back to that skew T? This might be a silly question. But uh, earlier you made the comment when we were talking about convergence that one's going to slide over the other. Is that what we're seeing as the wind finds with altitude? Are we seeing the westerly slide over the top of the easterly there? Not necessarily. Um, you get a shear zone, so um, as you as, as you increase in altitude, um, what happens close down to the ground is that as wind travels over the, the ground, uh, friction is created between the air parcel and the ground, which slows it down and then creates localised wind directions. Once you get up into altitude, um, the wind direction is more closely aligned with the higher altitude winds. <coughs> because there's less ground friction, which is created by the hills and turbulence and everything else, and you end up with this more um, sort of one directional system, um, which is why, I mean, you can, you can see it there, um, the wind direction up high is going that way, it's probably what the, the upper level um, parcel is doing, or the, maybe the stream, and then as it comes down, it's, it's hitting potentially Another parcel of year, um, but the general direction is that it wants to, okay. to maintain. But yeah. I guess where I was going with that that question is is the uh, diagram showing the convergence line looks a little more west than some of the yeah. examples that Joe that's, showed. That's just generally because um, this convergence was very rare that it was over the western side of the North Island. Quite often we get convergence over the eastern side. And that's purely because of the way that um, if you look at how a high, if you've got a high pressure system sitting over the North Island, it travels in an anticyclonic fashion or an anticlockwise, um, which then means that you get a stronger flow of air coming around from the west and then in, which then means that even though you're getting the, the breeze from the east, it's actually sea breeze. And that sea breeze is fighting the more meteoro meteorologically driven wind at the height, and so you push it over to the west. In order to get convergence uh, over to the east, in order to get convergence on the west, you need hot air and, and good air, but you need the system to be reversed where you've got a sea breeze from the west, but a meteorological wind coming in from the east.
Is that the isobarical you uh, refer to meteorological? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, like when you look at isobars on a on a weather chart, I've got a low, and then I've got all the lines and all the winds flowing around them in a certain direction. Um, that direction is just dictated by the wind traveling from a, a high pressure area to a low, low pressure area. Um, and where that high or low sits will help determine where the convergence is going to end up on the, the coast. The whole thing of the breezes coming together and one going above the other is because they can't just hit each other like a wall and then suddenly decide to do this. One mass of air will be colder, one mass of air will be warmer, and the colder, denser air will drop below the water there, and so you end up with the air coming from, say, the east coast that's warmer and lighter flowing up. So if you're flying on the eastern side of the convergence, you'll be in lift. If you drop into the western side out of the convergence, you're going to start sinking down. <coughs> Does that make sense? Yes. Quite a lot of convergence is marked by two different pipe cloud bases as well. Yeah. The main side will be a higher cloud base. Sometimes it's not there, but here sometimes it's one or two thousand feet high. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just a bit more of a yeah, be on the road. To the to the point where sometimes people be like, how could how how are you possibly flying four thousand five hundred feet and cloud base was four thousand? You were cloud flying. And then they might have a video and they show a video and they're just flying in clear sky, but the fact is that where they are is on a different side of the convergence. The clouds are sitting really low on one side and they're on the other side up in the blue sky, curling up the, almost on the side of the, the uh, convergence curve. Um, any other questions? So if you want to cross the convergence where that is the case, you, you, you're, um, you're on the wrong side of the convergence and you're actually in heavy sink and you just put the full speed bar on and you just perpendicular find your yeah. you lift on the other side of the conversions if you can get there yeah. before you it would be quite hard. It would be hard. You, the sink rate will be yeah, you as in what happens, I haven't got a whiteboard to draw it, but if you imagine the, the lines on there, imagine that this is our hot air rising up and this side is the cold air going down that way. If you are thermal here in the warm air and you cross over and you start sinking and you decide you want to put the speed bar on and drive this way, your sink rate's probably going to be so much that even though you're traveling in this direction, there's an angle here, right? And you're just going to, you're, you're going this way, but you're going down with the angle and you're not actually going to necessarily be able to cross into the other side. And then when you do cross into the other, the other side, you're no longer in a convergence lift because convergence lift tends to be the real conversion stuff is up high and it's drawing the thermal lift from over the sides. So what you're saying is trying to cross the conversion is almost futile unless you're underneath the really. I think if you're in that position you probably want to try about like that. I mean if you, if you fall out of lift, like if you're halfway through thermal and you just fall or you just keep turning and come back into it. But if you've flown like a line down the convergence and then like continued into sync and be like, oh, I'll find something soon. And you finally make the decision now I'm going to turn around and go back. You're not going to, you know, it's not a really, you know, once of recovering. Yeah. Sorry to be sad, sad. <laughs> <laughs>
way we have lost it. Yeah, but thanks for listening to my dull uh, tones for the last little while. And, and Joe's, yeah. That was and, terrible. Uh, <laughs>